we're going to get our Q&A underway. We know you guys got a lot of questions out there that you probably want to answer. But before we do that, let's bring up our very special guests. Please welcome with a big round of applause from the horror classic, an American Werewolf in London, director John Landis. From the hit Resident Evil, please welcome John Dimonin. So we'll start out our Q&A uh, with our two Johns. Uh, John Landis, we had on Wednesday an employee preview of an American Werewolf in London house, and uh, there was not one asylum person walking out of that haunted house. How does it feel to have your movie brought to life uh, here at Halloween Horror Nights? Odd. <laughs> it's fun. No, it really is fun. I, I, w I wish I could see it in two weeks. Because what I've seen is that the people, the performers in the house, in the maze, they have to get used to the rhythms of the crowd. And they said, so, well, done it two nights now. So it's, I'm interested to see it in two weeks. I'm, very happy with them, very happy with the puppets, um, the wolves themselves. And it's fun, it's fun to see it. It's a real science that Mike and these gentlemen have perfected, these scary mazes, and it's great. Although I have to tell you, just standing up there listening to all, all three of you talking, I thought, can you imagine if someone like, this is like what's happening to our civilization. <laughs> like everybody, it's so gross, it's so gory, it's so terrifying. And I realized, yeah, it's like my idea of a good time. <laughs> Thank you, John. And uh, John D., we know that uh, the video games are an absolute hit. What is it like for you seeing these games go from you know, a television screen and actually reenact it live with a video concept that, you know, that's developed digitally, now is, it's visceral, it's here with us. <laughs> well, hold on. John Landis? I'm sitting next to John Landis. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get that out of the way. Uh, it's truly an amazing experience. I mean, you know, when you're watching a horror movie, right, it, it's kind of more of a passive entertainment experience. But Resident Evil is known to be like interactive horror, right? And to really see these uh, these creatures come to life, it's a kind of a different level of horror. I mean, in a video game, you know, you're you're playing against uh, you know, these creatures and you're running away. Well, there's no running away from these in real life, so it's it's really amazing. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Well, let's go. Uh, we got a couple of spotters in the audience with microphones. Let's go to a question from the audience, and then uh, we will uh, go back to the panel. We have a question. Somebody's talking. Yes, sir, right here. You can stand up. I think it's a pretty intimate room, so I think we'll all hear your question. Go ahead. You've been working on this for a year. What's tonight like for you? Uh, <coughs> relieving. <laughs> um, no, it's it's a culmination of, of a year's worth of effort um, by a, a, a huge team of, of, of talented designers and artists and technicians and costume builders and prosthetic uh, builders. Uh, you know, we've been thinking about this again for an entire year, and and uh, you know, it was surreal just tonight. You know, walking past the mazes and the sound stages, people seeing the people finally exit the sound stages and screaming and, and reacting to what we're, what we've created um, hand in hand for a year uh, together, all in the sake of amazing horror. Uh, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. It's 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 the it's the best moment you can possibly have when it, when it all clicks and all works. So it's happening tonight and everybody gets to experience it. So of course over the past year and all the work that everyone has put so much effort into, what will things be like moving forward over the next couple of months now that this is actually a work in progress? Well, you know, I think uh, I think John said it, you know, it, you go from tonight and from our preview night and over the next couple of weeks, the event just built its own energy. It, the, the cast uh, in the houses get sharper, they build a rhythm, they see people come through the house, they get that energy from them, they get sharper in their scares and their attacks, the streets get more timing, um, it just gets better and better, the event just builds and builds and builds. And for us, it's uh, it's a culmination of that year of taking it from a piece of paper and a thought and an idea. It, it can't, it, 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 tonight is all about the screen. You hear the screen for the first time. 
And well, awesome. you know, you, you, there is so much work, as you were saying, that is put into it, and it, of course it evolves. And you know, you could say that there are others out there that have tried to do something like this. What makes our event here at Universal Orlando the best Halloween party, as you would, as you would call it? What makes it the best event? Well, I, I'll brag on, on every, I'll, I'll exclude myself and brag on everybody else who works on it. Um, it. The reason it's the best in the world is because we have the most talented people working on it who bring their skills to it with Universal's resources that are unlike anybody else's in the world. Um, we've got the design eye and the passion for it and the intent to bring what's on the screen um, in a motion picture in a television series, in a video game, to life. And I think the passion for the detail to the level that we can bring it that no one else can, uh, I think is what sets us apart and makes us the number one Halloween event anywhere in the world. Great answer. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's a good round of applause. So we also took uh, questions from some of our viewers and some of the folks that were interested via Twitter. So uh, John D, we have a question for you. This is from Rebecca Smith via Twitter. She okay. wants to know, can fans of the classic Resident Evil games look forward to seeing their favorite protagonists like Claire and Leon? Well, you know, I don't want to give too much away in this point of experience, but yes. <laughs> you're going to see Claire, you're going to see Leon, exactly how you remember them from the video games. Even the voiceover is very similar. I mean, when you're talking about attention to detail, Mike Yellow and his team are really impressed because they're fans. And they had so much passion you know, for our IP, they were great partners to work with. So we really worked together to make sure we gave an awesome, authentic experience for people who love the classic series. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura, this question is for you. Why did you decide to dedicate this year's street experience solely to The Walking Dead? Because we've had a lot over the years. There have been a lot of different dynamics and a lot of different characters. Why evolve all the characters around that particular um, series? Well, with the success of our house last year that we did, and with this, the amazing success of the AMC television series, it was just the perfect timing for us to take our whole street program, revamp it, really take one IP and create this spectacular, large scale experience throughout the entire park. Um, with The Walking Dead, like I said, the three seasons gave us a lot to work off of and it just fit within our environments. Each season fit perfectly within the different environments we have in the park. So it was just a really good relationship and a really good marriage. Fantastic. Can't wait to see it. Uh, let's take another question from the audience. Yes, sir, right here in the front. Uh, for John D. and Mike, I guess, uh, Resident Evil is a huge franchise at this point with multiple games, multiple movies. How did you decide? You said you were mostly focusing on the second and third game. How did you decide? Here's the era we'll focus on. Do you all of you, is that a question for you, or do you want to... I think we can quit them, I believe. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, you know what? We'll talk together at once. <laughs> so... If you ask, I'll take the first one. First one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to steal the thunder here. Um, if you ask our fans, you know, some of the favorite games in the series is Resident Evil 2 and 3, but we really wanted to focus on the environment surrounding Raccoon City. And for those of you who don't know Raccoon City, is this is Midwestern town where a viral catastrophe happens that's turning all these inhabitants into zombies and other creatures we call bioorganic weapons. And so just capturing that whole mood, uh, that whole mystery surrounding this viral outbreak, was, I think was important to us and important to the fans. I mean, they really were calling for some more classic survival horror, which is our, one of our pillars of our franchise. Yeah, and, and for us, it, uh, translating two and three, it was, it was more about the textures involved with that. that it, the, colors, the color palette is a bit different. Um, you know, last year the video game was about bringing that video game to life for us. This year, we really tried to put players into the game. Down to, you know, when you walk through the maze, keep a, you know, when you're not getting scared out of your, out of your wits, keep a close eye on some of the props that are in the room because we've actually placed items from the game uh, sprinkled throughout the maze. The lighter, the we have a save point room. Yes. Um, the ammo. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I've been in these houses. People aren't going, oh, look. No, <laughs> 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 oh, I saw that they're, they're going like this. Ah! <laughs> That's so funny. It's I love that they're going like, what remarkable <laughs> attention. <laughs> Seventeen. I was in the den playing the game. That lamb scared shitless. Fair enough. 
Okay, it's just yeah. for me then, I guess. <laughs> it's rough geeks. Truthfully, actually, I'm just being subversive. But <laughs> the truth is, I think it does make a difference. I mean, I just know from werewolf, it's like, Six people just from that little group said to me, oh, they had the Mickey Mouse. You know, so I'm thinking, okay, so I'm just teasing. <laughs> sure, I'm sure, though, speaking of that, you do make a good point. If I'm a gamer, and this is my favorite game, maybe going into the house, I'm thinking, I'm going to look for these things. I, I, want, I want to feel like I am in the game, just having a slightly different experience this time. Well, definitely, you're probably going to go through this like this, you know, you're scared, but you want to see all the detail. But I think that attention to detail, really it was interesting to watch the whole creative process go through. I mean, everything from the slightest um, touches, like how, how the ears of the zombie dogs would point, we went through a couple revisions on that. And it's funny, because you think, well, that's a really small detail. But see, something about our Resident Evil fans is that we have those loyal, vocal and critical fans in the whole industry, and I say that very lovely. Uh, but anytime they see any sort of inaccuracy, they're the first ones to tell us, and we're really respectful uh, you know, of, of our fan base. Like that. And it is really just to provide the best experience possible for our fans. Well, you're definitely going to get it. Let's take uh, another question from the audience here. Yes, sir. Bye, sir. John Landis, um, just wondering, when you made Werewolf Horror, it was still a very niche genre. Can you explain, do you have any reasoning why it's gone so mainstream in the last few, maybe in the last 10 years, it's really taken off? It's not just horror, science fiction and fantasy. You know, the big sea change has been that what's always been exploitation and B product, and they kind of point to George and Steve. They say it's Star Wars and Jaws, which are essentially, you know, Flash Gordon and the Greek from Black Lagoon. So it, they're B pictures made with A budgets. And that, no, that's true, that's what's happened. And now all the major, that's what's happened. It's sort of like the industry's turned over. And I think that's just a general cultural trend. I think zombies are really interesting is the popularity of zombies because, you know, all horror films are metaphors. I mean, all fantasy is metaphor. So what is a zombie exactly? And ultimately, I think zombies, you know, they always talk about the zombie apocalypse. A, you know, it's a disease, or it's from, you know, nobody talks about voodoo anymore. Now it's radio, radioactivity or aliens or the government or something. And I think with some, World War Z, did you see that? That was funny, I thought. I guess. <laughs> Good thing Brad's here. No, but the... <laughs> Zombies, I really believe they're so popular because they represent anarchy and the loss of control and the collapse of society and, and look around the world, you know, that's, I think that's what we're scared of and that's what's happening in a lot of places. Great answer, thank you. Let's take another question from the audience. Yes, sir, all the way over here. Black shirt, glasses. Oh, John. How many emails did you actually get before you were like, all right, well, maybe let's hear what they have to say. How many emails did you get before you were like, all right, let's listen to what they have to say. Cool. Like, are you talking about uh, being convinced to allow their product to be okay? So the, I, I believe the question is how how long did it take to uh, to massage the both of you into allowing this to happen? <laughs> I think I wrote about 500 emails over to Michael saying, "Please use our ID." <laughs> it, was, it was the opposite. It was the other way around. Actually, <laughs> well, actually, they they had asked me for quite a while. Quite a while. They said five years. I guess it predates you, but they've asked me for a while, and I've always been hesitant. Um, but in fact, I came. Mr. Timon had pretty much. No, sorry. I'm too tight in that to come down. He's French. And it, but he's French. <laughs> Nobody knows they have a whole horror maze called, you know, the Eclair of Death. <laughs> They'll burn your secrets too soon. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a long day. <laughs> I'm sorry. But anyway, you know what? I I came and asked. It's you. You're, I learned you're the person from the chainsaw people, huh? Yeah. I was here at the bar. You know, I turned the lights down and I came. You know, the later it is, the scarier it is. And, and I came and all of a sudden there's this horrendous noise. And I look over and there were like 11 Leatherface guys. It's really about charging me. And I thought, I'm scared. And it really was intense. And I thought, well, you know, 
okay. And my, these guys have a science. They've made a science of these names. And uh, in a game, it's interesting because in a video game, the interactive level really lends itself to a maze. And a narrative like Werewolf, where it's a, you know it's the beginning, middle, and end of the story. I thought, well, what are they, how are they going to? And actually, it's it's a very specific thing. And I I think they did a great job. I'm fascinated. I mean, it's frustrating for me. They're used to it, but I'm used to having control of where people are looking and stuff. And just watching, I've only seen a couple hundred people go through, but I keep thinking, wait, you know, they're so scared, they jump at this, and so they walk real fast, and I go, but you didn't see that. <laughs> you know, they're like, and there's this amazing, the first kill on the moors is incredibly well done. And they're all running screaming. They're not they're not looking. I keep thinking, don't you want to see that? There is so much work in that. You know, they're 200 feet away. I don't know. It's so it's interesting. And I realize that every time they go to the maze, it's a different experience. Yes. Yes. So that was impressive. So I, I said yes, and I'm actually very pleased that it did. Great question. Yes, another one. You, sir. And then we'll come to you in the back there. Absolutely. Yes, sir, right here. John, you mentioned the word anarchy. Did you ever for one minute think about Marrying the Blues Brothers, Frat Boys from Animal House, and where we'll be Wait, actually, what did I suggest today? Yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> 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 no, I put my commission. My is going to be a haunted animal house. Me. <laughs> but, you know, the, the Blues Brothers of Death. I don't know. <laughs> I, actually, we, we are doing. We should next year. But there's going to be, you know, the, the three amigos horror maze. <laughs> Watch out for the hit press. All right, let's go into the back to the young lady that was here. Like, yes, ma'am. Go and stand up if you would. So tell us the secret. What's Halloween Horror Nights 24 going to be like? Um, uh, different from 23. <laughs> That, that's all I can say. Yes, it'll be scary. <laughs> that means no. Next question. Yes, sir. 23 years of Halloween Horror Nights. Why did it take so long for American World to come <laughs> Well, be because John Landis was incredibly difficult to convince. <laughs> no, actually, actually, it. it, it We've been in conversations about American Werewolf for several years. It, it was a passion project. Uh, you know, and, and John was hard to convince um, to, to come play with us. But I think it was good that, that it took time because, you know, one of the things that does set us apart, and, and Scotty asked this question earlier about what makes Halloween Horror Nights different from every other experience in the world. We talked about kind of the commitment, the, the, the talent, what Universal does. One of the things that we really do really well, I think, is we work with the filmmakers and the, the IP holders and, the, and the, the people that make the games and make the motion pictures and make the television series. We reach out to the, the creators. We want them involved with us. We know how to do Halloween. We do it better than anybody in the world. And, and John said it, we, we have a science to it. But we want to reach out to the people who created it, who made it, who wrote it, who filmed it, who designed it themselves originally. And it took us a long time to bring Werewolf here. And it, it, I think it pays off. That, that time that it took gave us a lot of time to think about it. Um, and a lot of time to work with John to create it. And so it, yeah, it took a long time. Um, but it was worth it. I think you'll see it tonight. Well, I think it also serves itself as well, from what John was saying, as far as what's going on in our current culture. And also fads, would you say, will lend a lot to what the experience is going to be at a certain time. So, as you guys are so great at doing, is projecting what a new fad or how the culture is changing. You kind of, because I'm thinking back while you're answering that, on 14 and, and 7, it just seems like every time there's a Halloween Horror Night, some way, shape, or form, it fits the fad and the culture of what we're experiencing at that particular time. So you guys are like decades ahead of yourselves. Let's go and to the center here. Yes, sir. Uh, this is for John Landis. Um, did you, going back 32 years and plus to when he made American Werewolf, Animal House, and Blues Brothers, did you ever think of your wildest dreams that those movies become part of the touchstones of the Universal Studios experience? Being in the... No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what has that been like, I guess, seeing these indoor, you know, to where every night people see it in the cinematics, it's spectacular. And in this I, I've been very lucky that I've 
made a number of films that are still playing. And, uh, you know, a movie, the only test of a movie, it's not contemporary reviews, it's not how much money it makes, it's time. So if you can watch a movie 30 years later and it's still entertaining you, that's, I'm delighted, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Um, but no, I mean, I made for Universal a picture called Into the Night. You'll notice there's no Into the Night ride. <laughs> you know, that picture made no money, and people went, Michelle Pfeiffer, who, you know, it never exists at all. And that was a failure. But so, but I worked just as hard on that as I did on the successes. You never know. It's all about the zeitgeist and timing and luck. We got it. I'm going to get to a question here in a second. We do have a Twitter question that we want to get to. This is for Laura. This is from Tyler Scott via Twitter. Um, can you give a little insight into the Bill and Ted show as it comes together and a pretty big part of Halloween Horror Nights as well? I know we've talked about some of the great mazes and other concepts, but what about Bill and Ted? Um, I'll take this one. Um, yeah, Bill and Ted, I think this is the 22nd year for that show. Uh, pop culture spoof show uh, based on literally everything that's happened over the past year. Um, the one thing that we kind of put into the show this year uh, differently than what we've done in the past is it does have a horror element to it. It actually is a Halloween adventure this year. Um, it, it, there, it's, it's, it's on a camp with teenagers, um, celebrity teenagers that you may know of. Um, and so it has, a, it has a horror aesthetic this year. We haven't really done that with Bill and Ted in the past. Uh, so that was kind of a neat, neat item to kind of inject into the show this year. Um, but yeah, but it's still very much Bill and Ted. Um, and uh, I just love the fact that it's still Bill and Ted. That it's still those guys. Because I think nowadays, I think most people know them from our show rather than the movie. And so, <laughs> although I hear pre tell there's, there's talk of a third, which would be frighteningly cool, maybe? <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's rock and rolling. And uh, Jason Horn was the writer and director of that show this year. He, yeah, uh, he, he's done a really great job. I hope, hope you guys enjoy it tonight. Thank you for the answer. Hey, Sonny, yes. Sonny, we're going to take two more questions. Okay, sounds good. Do you have someone there that has a question with you, or I'll just go to the audience again? Two more questions or what? <laughs> <laughs> I think we may be pressed on time. So, death. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here in the second row. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, when you guys consider what you guys are going to do as a house. How important is a few years ago you had Phantom of the Opera and Silver Screens, you have Silver Screens, excuse me, you have an, an American Girl from London. How important is it to reach back while you're reaching forward and sort of bring horror genre fans from the past? Because there are a lot of people here who may not have seen some of those films. So how do you figure out what you're going to put in the next? With regard um, to classics. Absolutely, as far as, as far as hitting those touchstones in, within the slate. Right. Um, I think we always try and at least do one or two mazes every year that, that kind of harken back to, to the tried and true era of horror. I'm a huge classic monster fan. That's what I grew, that's what I grew up on. Um, and any time we're able to, to inject the event with something that is, is in the more of a classic sense that, that shows kind of where horror began and you're able to kind of see a timeline in the event. Um, I think that that's important. I think it's also really cool that people who may have not seen the film in any given year that we're representing it in a more classic sense, it almost is a gateway. Like they'll experience the maze first and then discover, oh, I really want to kind of see what that was based on. I'm not sure those kids and teenagers going through the mazes this year that they may have never seen an American World of London. This will be their first view into that, that, that realm. And they'll leave here and go, I, I, want, to, I want to see what what they adapted. I want to see how that worked in, in, in John's film. I uh, think that's really cool, and I think it's important for the event to not only scare you, but I, this is geeky of me, I like to educate some people as well in, in horror. I think, that, I think that's important. I, I, want, I want to just say one thing that really does make you, this event special, and it, Jim used the word passion, and you used the word geek, but I have to tell you, these guys, they really are passionate geeks. I mean, they really are. <laughs> They're very excited about this stuff, and they really enjoy their work. And um, he wasn't kidding about the screams. We were walking. We were walking here, and I don't know, what, what was it we were passing where people were, were screaming in there? Oh, I think it was the kitchen. No, it was the Captain of the Woods. We were walking yeah, I don't know, we were walking past, and these girls said, screaming out of there, and he was beaming, <laughs> beaming, I mean, and that, you can't buy that, 
I'm serious, that kind of enthusiasm. I mean, it makes it special. Also, I want the people who work here, who sign up for Halloween, how many, how many scared, what do you call them, scared characters? How many? About a thousand. A thousand people come for minimum wage, you know. <laughs> Employees with full benefits. Uh, we know that's not true. Okay. <laughs> what percentage of them? What percentage of them are repeat who come back? There's probably ninety percent of our characters that come back every year. Yeah, every year uh, in July, the first audition. We have a re big reunion audition, and every year it seems to grow. And and every year, more and more of our characters are coming back. So what's crazy is it used to take us all the way up till October to cast this entire event and keep it cast. Now we're cast by the second week of July. Wow. So it's pretty amazing. But it's that level of enthusiasm. It's it's they're really into it in a way that. It, you can't buy it. I mean, they, it's really an interesting thing. We tell them about the, there's a lawyer from Tampa. <laughs> in the past, yeah, we, uh, he, he has a practice, and um, I, I don't think he's working with us uh, the last couple of Probably years. in jail. <laughs> During the day, and, and, and for, for many years, he would take a vacation for two months from his practice, come here and perform at the event, and then go back to his day job uh, after two months. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the people that, that would never dream of doing something like this end up catching that bug and wanting to, to scare scare people uh, for two months and, and come here and do it. So yeah, it's remarkable. Okay, we've got time for one more question, and we'll give it to the loudest screamer in the house that wants to ask the question. Okay, up top there, the server your head with your question. She's your queen to be! <laughs> Now, Landis, alright man, there's certain movies that always put a necklace and hit us in the heart, man, but we're right there in the remote. We've seen it a million times! Do you know, do you know Boondocks? <laughs> Boondocks, I know many people who do. I've seen, I think the comic strip and then the yeah, animated show. Yeah, well, Aaron yeah. Magruder. Young guy who, who does boot docs invited me to his wedding. And I thought, why am I being invited? Okay, sure. So we went to this very nice wedding. And I won't tell you who, but a famous African American actor came out and sang that song. And she walked down the aisle. And I thought, man. Alright, so what are the top two that you're like sitting there, you've seen it a billion times, which ones do you sit there and actually watch? Of oh, my films? Yeah, your films. I don't watch my films. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them. <laughs> that DVR or what have you, they always connect with you. Oh, you mean of movies? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, hmm. That's a tough one because I have hundreds of favorite movies. There are certain movies that, you know, if, they, if you're turning channels and it's on TV, you just get, like Godfather 2, you just get sucked in. <laughs> Good fellas, you know. <laughs> Wizard of Oz or King Kong, you're, I, you know. There are a lot there. You know what? I couldn't. I hate those top 10 lists and stuff. I have too many films that I just love. You know what breaks my heart now is most people will see Lawrence of Arabia 2001 on their iPad. <laughs> As a filmmaker, that kills me. <laughs> but I don't have, I don't honestly don't have a favorite. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex Diaz, <laughs> for your very energetic question and performance. Our teams will be calling your teams in the AM. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how about a big round of applause?